So it is my pleasure and honor this night to have one of the great guests and the beloved professors in the Arab world, Robert Najem. Professor Robert Najem is the head of nephrology department at Lebanese Hospital. Uh, he is the president, professor of nephrology at Faculty of Medical Sciences, Lebanese University. This is the pleasure today to have Professor Robert with us. He is uh, graduated uh, for, uh, since 89 from the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Lebanese University. Uh, then he completed his training uh, from France. I visited Lyon in 2000. I know the, that uh, Lyon is one of the most important cities in organ transplantation. So uh, uh, Claude Bernard University in Lyon is a fantastic place. He is the immediate past president of Lebanese Society of Nephrology and Hypertension. Uh, he is the president ethical committee for living organ donation. And he uh, chaired in the MMM and I'm going to just to announce what's meant by MM in a minute. MMM country leader and World Kidney Day Lebanon Activity uh, Coordinator. He is now the president-elect of Arab Society of Nephrology. As I mentioned, he uh, is a professor. He has researched, and this is one of his publications. I'm not going to discuss uh, details in presentation, but what I'd like to highlight is this. MMM. What's meant by MMM? It is May Measurement Month. Because in May, there is a day for World Day for Hypertension. And the main aim of this day is to, to uh, uh, raise the awareness of blood pressure. And this is the, how the pamphlet of the World Day of Hypertension focuses on healthy exercise and then to diagnose, screen, and the proper management of hypertension. And from this article, this is a very nice article published in the European Heart Journal last year, I would like to share with you this figure. This is, this is a very interesting figure because hypertension, as always we say, it is a silent killer because it adversely affects all body organs, including heart, kidney, retina, and others. Look carefully at this slide, please. If we go to focus on the low-income countries, 70% are not on medication, no treatment. Only 13% are on medication and controlled. Worldwide, 44% not on medication, 22% not, not controlled, and 33%, one-third is only treated and controlled. This means that even in the high-income, 38% not on medication. This means that there is unmet needs and the gap in the management of hypertension, not only in the low income countries, but worldwide. So if we say hypertension is a disease or a syndrome of many facets, we should do something. And I think MMM is one of the very nice, and Pro Professor Robert Najem is one of the leaders, investigators, in this MMM. Uh, Professor Robert, these are five lectures are already uploaded to the Egyptian Society of Nephrogen Transplantation from Professor Robert's presentation. And today will be the fifth. This is from Nephrotanta. And this is where we joined the Professor, Professor, Professor Robert Nedm with uh, uh, the many professors and the colleagues from Egypt, Professor Jamal Saadi, uh, Professor Salah Naga, and all uh, colleagues and professors. And here was uh, Professor Gunaymat uh, and Dr. Professor Kamal Okasha, Dr. Ghad, Dr. Dina. And this is where we visited Lebanon in 2018 with uh, Professor Robert Najem and uh, Professor Tai El Baz in the Asnar Spring Nephrology Forum in collaboration with Lebanon, Lebanese site of nephrology and hypertension. It was very fantastic days to join them. So today we have, uh, as we have a, a beloved professor to present, we have also beloved professor to moderate. So Professor Tai El Baz, 
um, if I speak about Professor Ta'il Baz, I can spend the whole night and I cannot uh, give him uh, everything because we work it together in establishment of one of very nice template that I love. Do you remember this, this day, Professor Tar El Baz, in June 2012, when we meet together with Professor Khaled Uweda at the ASNT Hall with just four candidates or five candidates, and I delivered a presentation about contrast-associated acute kidney injury. From this day, we decided to do something uh, for Egyptian community and for the Arab world, which is Egyptian sort of nephrology, a virtual academy. And this was the birth. Then, uh, as you see, in this early days, we say CNE, continuous nephro nephrology education. But we changed it to CME in nephrology because CNE may be mistakenly as continuous nurse education. And this is the official announcement of virtual academy in September 2012. And then today, I am very proud, and I think Professor Tail Baz is very happy. This is the content that we have in the virtual academy. 4,636 lectures, 1,885 video. A lot of, even the Mansoura PhD degree in nephrology is already there. And we have users worldwide, more than 28,000 users. So it is a very fantastic job founded and started by the willing of the president, Professor Ta'il Baz, who was the president of the Egyptian Society of Nefroja at that time. And today, is, and this is just to show that the support of Professor Ta'il Baz is unlimited. And this is early this year in Jordan, in the Dead Sea, when he uh, encouraged me to highlight the Congress. Always, I'm happy to work with Professor Ta'il Baz. And he, this is one of the quotation, I always like it. And he was the first one uh, uh, to say to me, happy is the man who can make a living by his hobby. And this is what we do in education, trying to do something and our hope to allow Egyptians and Arab to fly to the future. I'm sure this night will be exceptionally very nice uh, night because we have giants uh, from Lebanon. We have Professor Robert Najem. He will speak about management of hypertension in patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, both hypertension and chronic kidney disease, I can consider them as deadly alliance. So today I'm eager to hear from Professor Robert Najem about uh, this uh, issue. But before his presentation, I'm leaving the mic to Professor Tari El Baz to welcome Professor Robert Najem until he uh, can share his slides. Thank you very much. Hoping you the best night, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Shasha, for the nice introduction. Please, Tari. Professor Tari, yes. Um, we appreciate so much uh, the willingness of Professor uh, Robert Najem uh, to be with us uh, tonight. I know he's very busy. He is deeply indulged in uh, putting the hospital where he is working back into order with a wonderful spirit that he shares with all the beautiful Lebanese people. I'm sure Lebanon will always be standing tall and will be delivered by God, hopefully, inshallah, very soon. And we will see Beirut more and more beautiful than before. I thank Robert so much for being with us. Uh, bringing all these friends together tonight. As for Professor Shaisha, he's, he's over, overwhelming me with his kindness and kind words. Uh, I regard Hussein uh, Shaisha as uh, a phenomenon. He just happened during the last uh, so many years. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Tarr. He's doing a great effort uh, Honestly, I, ha I haven't seen or met anyone so much dedicated in the educational process and has the capacity to be by so many people and bringing everybody together like tonight, who could ever manage this but him? And this is just because he has this wonderful talent. He is, he's out of any kind of competition or classification. He just sits in a very special place 
and I love him for what he is. And God bless you, Hussein. And let us enjoy what Professor uh, uh, Robert has to uh, tell us today about hypertension. Please, Robert. Thank you very much, Professor Tarek, for all these kind words. And before Professor Robert, I would like to thank all the attendees, especially my professor from Arab world, Professor Yad Saeed, Professor Faisal Shaheen, and all my colleagues, Professor Saeed Khamiz, Dr. Tarek Tantawi, and all my colleagues. I hope to be very nice night delivering a very hot uh, topic. Professor Robert, I will share the please screen. share your slide, please. Yes. Open your uh, presentation. Okay. Um, yes, it's okay. Uh, okay. I would like to thank you for the introduction, uh, Professor Shasha, Professor Tare. Uh, a kind reminder about MMM. Uh, 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 2019, we did a great job. We don't have the result uh, till today uh, due to the COVID epidemic. We participate in Lebanon with 7,000 uh, candidates for uh, hypertension screening. It was a huge for the first time in Lebanon. We'll have, uh, I think, nice results. We are not allowed to, uh, to announce our, uh, our data before the International Society of Hypertension. So we are waiting uh, first uh, the announcement from uh, and the publication from ISH. I would like to congratulate you, Professor Robert, about this activity because this article included one and a half million from all over the world. Yeah. So, and you are the representative of Lebanon. We had in this article yes. only around 1,000 patients in 2018. In 2019, we had 7,000 patients. It was a great job with the Ministry of Public Health and supported by Servier worldwide, by Servier company. Okay. I will. I won't be late. I will start with this nice photo from uh, from Beirut. The paint. The painter uh, after the explosion. The, he painted Beirut. You know. I want. I don't want to explain to you what happens. It's uh, amazing, uh, horrible. Uh, I don't uh, know how to explain. In French, c'est affreux. Okay. So management of hypertension CKD, I divided in two parts. So outline, uh, I will speak first about hypertensive nephropathy, second on management of hypertension CKD. So what is hypertensive nephropathy? It's a myth or reality? Uh, benign hyperangiosclerosis is a histopathological diagnosis, but rare, we did rare biopsies for benign nephropathy. So hypertensive nephropathy is a clinical, a clinical biology presentation and chronology, hypertension, and then nephropathy. What's the definition? It's a chronic nephropathy from vascular origin due to an uncontrolled old hypertension. It can lead to end stage disease. The vascular disease consists of intimal thickening and luminal narrowing of the large and small renal and uh, the glomerular arterioles. The second cause of end stage disease are more frequent in blacks, as you know, in the States and in elderly people. These are the pathologic uh, lesions, as we said. And we'll start to talk about the patient, uh, Omar, 55 years old. The hypertension followed for and treated since age 35 years on Irbrisartan and amlodipine, full dose. Grade one hypertension, ABPM, uh, on EBPM and BMI 28. Uh, chronic renal failure, creatine 1.4 milligram per deciliter and CKD AP65 versus 75 five years ago. Proteinuria only 0 0.3 gram per day, no hematuria, no leukocyteuria, normal renal ultrasound and renal artery Doppler. And no particular past medical history uh, or renal toxic drug. So uh, they refer to nephrology uh, specialist, and we have to do kidney biopsy. So, study from 2001 on hypertensive, uh, 81 hypertensive patient grade two with chronic renal failure. And the pre presentation was compatible with benign nephrologic sclerosis did in Spain uh, by uh, Pereira. As I did kidney biopsy, what did they found? 
only 22% presented with benign nephrosis and 78% other causes. So of uh, membranes, 35%. 13 primary nephritis, IgA, membranous glomerulonephritis, mesenchymal capillary glomerulonephritis, chronic interstitial nephritis, and FSGS. So it was not only nephroangiosclerosis. In this prospective study by Zucchelli, older in 98, but this gold one, uh, diagnosis of hypertensive nephritis by a nephrologist, final diagnosis after evaluation with kidney biopsies. It's a prospective study. So only 32, uh, 46% will have true hypertensive nephrosis, 32% atheromatous neurovascular disease, 8% unclassified, uh, we have analgesic nephropathy, uh, IgA, immunotactoid, light chain uh, disease, depress disease. So what are the clinical biological presentation of nephrosis? Histology, nephrosis, so hypertensive nephropathy, non-hypertensive nephropathy, so age, CVD, uh, cardiovascular disease, APOL1, and other genetic factors. Histology difference, so we have to look glomerulopathy, cholesterol embols, and tubular ancestral nephritis. So which diagnosis can change the management? Cholesterol embolis, primary glomerulitis, chronic Tuberculosis, nephritis, uh, immunologic, infective, hereditary, and deposit dense disease, and renovascular pathology. So, which is for hypertension or chronic renal failure? Who leads hypertension leads to chronic renal failure? We will see. Here's a nice schema of pathology, pathophysiologic mechanism of hypertension in CKD. You know, when you have reduced glomerular uh, mass, have endothelial dysfunction, increased renin, uh, renin production, decreased sodium precipitation, and sympathetic nervous system overactivity, which leads all to increased systemic blood pressure. So, how to prove that hypertension leads to chronic renal failure? Are subject with normal renal function and high blood pressure prone to develop chronic renal failure. In normal renal hypertensive patient, lowering blood pressure limits the apparition of chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure patient lowering the blood pressure limits the progression of chronic renal failure. I will change the screen a little bit. Sorry. I'll send you, okay. Now this one, I can Okay. So, are subject with normal renal function and high blood pressure prone to develop chronic renal failure? This uh, uh, Mr. Fit study, you know the instance of SSG and disease by initial blood pressure is higher with stage four hypertension. It's very old from 96. And this study uh, uh, by Gauss in France uh, presented on 2019. Uh, they looked up or for 609 normal renal patient with essential hypertension, followed for 16 years. Age was 51 years. Blood pressure 156 over 95, and serum creatinine at baseline was 0 0.9, and they don't have, they didn't have proteinuria. So after 16 years follow up, 92% of the patient have unchanged serum creatinine. Only 40 patients, 0 0.3 percent, uh, 40 patients had the increase of 0 0.3 milligram per deciliter of creatinine. And only 9% have increase of 0 0.9 milligram per deciliter of creatinine. So uh, progression, there was no progression of renal failure or degradation of renal failure after 16 years follow up for six, 600 patients with essential hypertension. And normal renal hypertensive patients, lowering blood pressure, limits the apparition of chronic renal failure, we'll see. In this uh, 
123 randomized trial uh, study were included. About around uh, 300,000 patients were included. 71 compared active treatment against placebo. 31 compared different active drugs. Nine compared more intensive versus less intensive blood pressure control. And seven compared active treatment against placebo as well, comparing different active drugs. Five compared intensive versus less intensive blood pressure control as well, comparing different active drugs. So we'll see what did this, what the gave us the systemic review and meta analysis. Lowering blood pressure hypertension decreased the cardiovascular mortality only by reduction in mortality in stroke. Uh, minus 14% uh, maximum, minus 9% for CHD, and total minus 7%. For renal failure, it was non significant, no variation after uh, this long time in this different uh, studies. So, no different, no, it's not, it was not in favor of intervention to reduce. The decrease uh, prevention of renal failure. In chronic renal failure patient, lowering the blood pressure limits the progression of chronic renal failure. We'll see. The question is in CKD patient, you consider blood pressure control is an important issue because you expect a benefit on CKD progression, adverse cardiac events, or both. We'll see. MDRD 1994, systolic blood, blood pressure control 125 versus 140, 100% patient with chronic renal failure, they, uh, with creatinine more than three. It was negative if, if uh, uh, GFR, if proteinuria less than one gram per day, positive if proteinuria was more than one gram per day. So the only study with positive results was MDRD in 94. In ASK study 2002, it was also negative on GFR with, uh, straight con with strict control of systolic blood pressure. In RAIN 2005, negative also. In ADVANCE 2007, also negative for GFR, ACCOR 2010 negative for GFR, SPS3 2013 negative for GFR, SPRINT also negative for, for GFR and controlled group of, uh, strict control versus, versus normal control and HOPE 2016 it was also negative on GFR. What about CKD patient in SPRINT study? Uh, we had a huge number of patients uh, in standard control 1300 and also intensive control 1300 patients and the G main GFR was uh, around 48 milliliters per minute in both arms, in both group. So composite renal outcome as we know all it was non-significant in the sprint study. Also, uh, renal progress of patient sprint study, uh, and stage disease or doubling of serum creatinine, it was, there was no difference and non significant. And ASK study, evolution toward end stage renal disease at long term, and 100% of patients were, was, was on chronic renal failure, so no difference between usual blood, usual blood pressure or strict blood pressure. Association of intensive blood pressure control and kidney disease progression in non-diabetic patients with chronic kidney disease. It's a systemic review of and meta-analysis of nine randomized, randomized frontal trials, MDRD, ASK, RAIN, SPRINT, etc. And there was 8,000 CKD patients and systolic blood pressure difference was between four and 13 millimeters mercury and mean follow-up for three years and three months. What was the results on GFR decline it was non-significant, it's equal, it's no difference. 
On NSTG and disease, mean follow up also say three years and three months. It was also non significant. So, hypertension and chronic renal failure, how to prove it? Are subject with normal renal function and high blood pressure prone to develop chronic renal failure? No. In normal renal and hypertensive patients, lowering blood pressure limits the apparition of chronic renal failure? No. In chronic renal failure patients, lowering the blood pressure limits the progression of, renal, of chronic renal failure? We have the big example of uh, SPRINT study. No, unfortunately. So, in conclusion for the first part, link of causality between hypertension and chronic renal failure is based on observational studies disputable. Hypertensive nephropathy diagnosis is easily considered but false in general. And don't miss a treatable nephropathy. Don't hesitate to do a kidney biopsy when indicated, when you can do it. If you can catch a patient early in his disease. So hypertension and chronic renal failure is equal, renal failure is equal to high cardiovascular risk, what justifies the active treatment of hypertension. I have to comment a little comment uh, out of this uh, slides. We know all in our practice, daily practice, if you have a patient with chronic renal failure and the patient uh, uh, with normal hypertension and the patient with chronic renal failure with high blood pressure uncontrolled, the evolution is not the same. They go, the patient with uh, uncontrolled blood pressure, it's my experience in, in life after 25 years of practice, uh, all patients with high blood pressure uncontrolled, they go rapidly to end stage renal disease. They are, they go uh, more fast to end stage renal disease. Uh, but patient with controlled hypertension or with normal blood pressure, they are, they do well, very slow to end stage renal disease. It's my own, uh, my own practice. So we'll go to the second part. Uh, of the presentation, what are the different concepts of CKD used in recent hypertension guidelines? CKD categories according to KDGO 2012, okay, and according to AC, uh, ACC and American Heart Association 2017 and uh, European guidelines 2018. If we see the percentage of other You know, finish better now. Now yes. it's better. It's okay. But the connection is a little bit uh, variable. Internet connection is not uh, okay. Excellent. Very nice. Very nice. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, uh, the percentage of adults and elderly diagnosed of hypertension that fulfills the definition of CKD uh, on uh, KDGO guidelines 2012 is higher than 27% on adult population and 69% on elderly population. Despite the 2018 uh, ESCSH guidelines, it's only 11% in adult population and 44% in adult population. We'll see why in elderly population. Uh, because the different threshold to initiate antihypertensive drugs therapy and therapeutic targets in CKD patients difference between uh, 2012 KDGO and 2017 AHA and 2018 ESH. In 2012, uh, CKD patient we have to treat for, uh, with hypertension more than, with blood pressure more than 130 over 80, and the target less than 130 over uh, and less than 80. Uh, in uh, AHA, Guidelines 2017, it was uh, more made more simple. We have to treat all patients with blood pressure more, uh, with CKD patients with blood pressure more than 130 over 80, and the target is the same, less than 130 over 80. In uh, 2018, ESS, ESH, and ESC guidelines, it, uh, it's a little bit, little bit different. 
and uh, it's a bit amazing with the elderly patient because for uh, adult patients uh, we have to treat with blood pressure uh, more than 140 over 90 to, to the target between 130 139 and 70 79 despite the elderly people we have to treat uh, with, uh, with blood pressure more than 160 and more than, uh, than uh, 90 diastolic blood pressure with the same target same target 130 139 and 70 uh, i'm not uh, i don't agree with this target in elderly people i think we have to go patient by patient case by case and to treat earlier not to wait to 160 over and over 90 blood pressure i think we have to start also at the same level uh, 140 over uh, 90 uh, millimeter mercury so what are the factors that uh, contribute to hypertension in patients with CKD, uh, sympathetic activation, imbalance in prostaglandins or kinins, or kinins endothelin, and reduced uh, nitric oxide? So don't forget uric acid. Uh, a lot of studies on uric acid uh, to treat or not to treat, but uh, we agree all now we have to treat uh, high level of uric acid in CKD patients. Uh, we have the potential mechanism through which elevated serum uric acid and the levels may contribute to the development of progression and CKD and hypertension. We have endothelial dysfunction, reduced NO production, inflammation, oxidative stress, and stimulation of the renin angiotensin system. So we have a higher level of blood pressure and more hypertension. And I agree to treat uh, earlier uh, hyperuricemia and CKD patient and don't treat. Uh, we always forget an important cause of hypertension in our CKD patient. It's obstructive sleep apnea, especially in obese patient uh, and CKD obese patient. And you know the pathophysiologic association between uh, obstructive sleep apnea and chronic kidney disease. You have chronic intermittent hypoxia oxidative stress, inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, leading to proteuria and GFR decline. And we have sleep fragmentation arousal, sympathetic arousal activation, leading to hypertension, fibrosis, and glomerular hyperfiltration, all leading to GFR decline and proteuria. So uh, we have always to look and ask the patient uh, about uh, his quality of sleeping and uh, go to further evaluation uh, of uh, sleeping apnea. We know all the drugs that may induce or exacerbate hypertension, also in CKD patient, and says, of course, oral contraceptives, mimetics, mirocorticoids, glucocorticoids, erythropoietin. We use a lot of erythropoietin for CKD patient. Cyclo and tacrolimus, vascular anterior growth factor inhibitors, illicit drugs, and the herbal supplements. Our uh, Arab patient, our Lebanese patient, all Arab ones, they like uh, herbal supplements, so we have to pay attention always on herbal supplements. I found this article, very nice article from the Indian Society, from uh, Association of Physicians in, of India, about the management of hypertension and chronic kidney disease. And the concerns stated by an expert panel of Indian nephrologists, it is uh, very uh, well uh, done and uh, detailed. If you have the time, I took some algorithm. I will present you some algorithms for this presentation. If you have the time, look at this article. What is the proposed art, uh, algorithm for the measure of blood pressure in patients with chronic kidney disease for patients between 18 and 80? If blood pressure is below target, continue to monitor blood pressure and manage lifestyle. Uh, if no, start ACE, ORB, or CCB, monitor GFR and potassium, as we all know. And we know the goal blood pressure is uh, less than 130 over 80. And continue to monitor blood pressure and manage lifestyle. If it's okay, continue to monitor blood pressure. If no, reinforce medication and lifestyle endurance. Increase ACE, ARBs to maximum recommended dose, of course, with, uh, with uh, following the potassium level and creatinine. Consider adding CCB, diuretics, or beta blockers. 
if it is below below target, okay. If no, they have to refer to an nephrologist if blood pressure is not below target with at least three antihypertensive agents. They permit to uh, GPs to follow the patient up to three anti antihypertensive agents. It's good. It's better to send them earlier, but it's good. What about non-diabetic, non-CKD patients? The KD guidelines, given drugs to maintain blood pressure less than 40 and 1B over 90, 2D uh, keep less than 130 over 80, and if you have urine albumin more than 300 milligrams per 24 hours or equivalent, use antihypertensive drugs to maintain blood pressure at less than 130 over 80, it's old. What about diabetic? non-dialysis CKD patients, if we don't have uh, albuminuria and the office blood pressure more than 140 over 90, use antihypertensive drugs to maintain blood pressure at less than 140 over 90, 1B. And if urine albumin excision is more than 130 milligram per 24 hour or equivalent, office blood pressure more than 130 over 80, so use antihypertensive drugs to maintain blood pressure lower than 130 over 80 to the okay. What about the transplant patient with hypertension? So first we can start if they have blood pressure more than 130 over 80, we we'll start with CCB or the HP. Uh, and uh, we have to control, of course. Uh, cyclosporine and tacrolimus levels. There is uh, to uh, follow the level for the interactions. If the blood pressure is still more than 130 over 80, of course we have to control uh, Doppler of uh, renal artery of uh, the graft. It's uh, essential to do it. It's important to do it to uh, rule out the stenosis of uh, renal artery stenosis. If the GFR is less than 20 minutes per minute, we can use loop diuretics, beta blockers, alpha blockers, especially when you have a potassium more than 5.5. GFR between 20 and 40 minutes, we can minute per minute. We have to use, uh, we can use loop diuretics, ARBs, ACE inhibitors, and DRIs. Of course, we have to look after creatinine and, uh, and potassium level. If, uh, if uh, glomerular filtration sorry, is more than 40 minutes per minute, we can use everything, PID, the ARBs, A's, and the RE. Uh, if blood pressure is still more than 130 over 80, we can add beta blockers, alpha blockers. If no, uh, at the end, we can add minoxidil. So uh, what about the control of blood pressure in this patient? It's very special. Uh, step one, lifestyle modification at, to achieve dry weight. It's not easy, but we have uh, to try to do it. If it is not at goal, blood pressure more than 140 over 90, uh, initial drug choice, hypertension without compelling indication or hypertension with compelling indication. So we have to do, uh, to use drugs for compelling indication as there is. If no, Stage one hypertension, we can start with ACE or LB. Stage two hypertension, we start with two drug combination, usually uh, as all we do, ACE, RB, and CCB. If it is not at goal, we can add a beta blocker or clonidine. If no, the last step, step four, have to do work up for secondary cause, uh, and we can add minoxidil. It's good for uh, hair growth. So, uh, what is this? here the last algorithm about the management of resistant hypertension in patients with chronic kidney disease? A little bit complicated, but uh, you can keep it with you. Uh, initial, sorry. Sorry. We have to do the initial diagnosis of resistant hypertension. If you have three, uh, more than three hypertensive agents or at optimal dose, either including antibiotics or blood pressure goal at goal, but requires more than four antihypertensive agents to do, to do so. 
you have to exclude pseudo resistance, ensure proper blood pressure measurement, confirm adherence to prescribed treatment, evaluate the antihypertensive regimen for suboptimal dosing or and combination of agents, and avoid collision inertia. You have to be active with the patient. Uh, first, we have to do 24-hour uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to rule out uh, first white coat hypertension, if it exists. And identify the presence of a non-dipper versus dipper pattern. So we can uh, look at the chronotherapy, change uh, more than one or more antihypertensive agent from AM to PM dosing. I look to for physiologic assessment of volume access indication for up titrating, up titrating diabetic regimens. So we have to optimize diabetic regimens. Look for hyperactive RAS and optimize RAS blockade. And look for clues of hypertension mediated by uh, central nervous system, tachycardia, conscious heart failure, heart failure, and anxiety symptoms. And add or substitute beta blockers or alpha blockers plus beta blockade okay thank you for your attention and uh, this was my c2 and my office after the explosion and lebanon will rise again thank you dear friends thank you very much professor robert We're hoping all of us hope that lebanon will rise again because we we love lebanon because yeah, it, is the, it is the, the country and the Beirut is the city of beauty. So um, uh, I have uh, many comments, but I'd like, I prefer to leave the mic to Professor Tari el to start his comments. Okay. Dr. Dr. Tari. Professor Tari, yes. Thank you very to... much, uh, Professor Robert, for a uh, very comprehensive uh, overview about hypertension naturally. Natural hypertension is a very big part of nephrology. No wonder in Lebanon, your society is the Lebanese society of nephrology and hypertension. It's really understood the importance of hypertension. Let me start by asking you about hyperuricemia. You yeah. stated that hyperuricemia is something very important and may lead to progression, yes, of chronic kidney disease. But what is the state of art today actually in hyperuricemia. And if you intend to treat hyperuricemia in a chronic kidney disease state, when you know that this is simply a retention of the, of the serum uric acid rather than an essential or primary hyperuricemia, do you think this is okay? And to which level of GFR could we use whatever, uh, the new drug or the old drug, the aloperinol, because these are really very toxic to the kidney once serum creatinine starts to rise to a certain level. Please enlighten me a little bit about this point. Uh, we talk a lot in uh, the past as, uh, this issue about uh, leukemia, and there was there was a very nice presentation, elegant presentation by Professor Professor Rashad Barsoom the last year, I think, uh, uh, in Tanta meeting or uh, in Jordan, uh, there is a lot of new studies uh, proving that treating uh, hyperuricemia will, will delay uh, CKD progression. And there is, there, there is a, a lot of studies, ongoing studies. Personally, I, I am with the treatment. At which level we start? I think at nine, uh, at nine we have to start. To start at nine we have to start if we don't have any symptoms of uh, gout. Uh, second, which dose? Which dose? Uh, I continue to use uh, both uh, adenoric or xyloric, allopurinol or fibrosostat, despite the uh, warning about uh, cardiac issues in uh, fibrosostat. Uh, we have to pay attention. Uh, in Lebanon, our experience with fibrosostat, we use a very low dose. We use 40 milligram for all the patients daily, and even less than 40, uh, 40 milligram each 24 or 48 hours every two days. And it is very efficient. We have uh, levels between four and five uh, uric acid milligram per deciliter. Uh, 
allopurinol uh, it is less efficient when you have the ckd it's diff more difficult to use uh, at advanced stage of ckd less than uh, 20 minutes per minute of gfr this is my opinion about the treatment i mean we are if you, if you allow me i just want to further add uh, yes. aware of a very special uh, relationship between hyperuricemia and hypertension and this was shown by uh, johnson rick johnson some years ago with workers from and you could see the pathology actually there is arteriolar changes in relation to the hyperuricemia and the studies then the last decade about hyperuricemia and that it may lead to chronic kidney disease and you should treat these things are changing i'm i'm mixed up should Maybe Hussein, Hussein wants to uh, add a comment in this part, on this particular point because he had some kind of talk and good discussion uh, uh, last week in this particular point. Maybe I'd like to hear, uh, like to hear what he has to add. Thank you very much, Professor Tara, for this point because uh, we had a very nice meeting and discussion. Dr. Abgawad reviewed the update in the hyperuricemia and in gout in CKD. Uh, and uh, I had, uh, we had uh, Dr. Tarek Tanta with us as a moderator because he is also fond of uh, hyperuricemia. And after reviewing all the data, because unfortunately, uh, the recent randomized controlled trials published in New England Journal of Medicine early this year, well, uh, the, one of the very interesting and important study in the type 2 diabetes hyperuricemia was negative. But uh, uh, I agree with Professor Robert's uh, point of view. We don't like hyperuricemia. And it seemed that we agreed about nine milligrams per deciliter as threshold for treating with hyperuricemic yeah. drugs. All of us agree uh, about the exercise, non-pharmacological treatment, diet manipulation, and starting hyperuricemic drugs uh, uh, not waiting and because randomized control trial is not a real life and uh, the, this is why we treat okay. hyperuricemia because, because we are believing in the value of uric acid especially in hypertensive patients so this is the, what we agreed although the evidence-based medicine nowadays is still negative but we shouldn't take the randomized control trial as exclusive uh, for the patients the most important point is to select the drug. It seems that Fibuxtate is superior to albuterol, as shown from some studies published in nephrology domain and the retarding progression of chronic kidney disease, even a small sample size. And I, uh, I like the commentary of uh, Professor Robert about using small dose uh, even every other day because it needs uh, some modification with renal impairment. So this is I think we agree about, although the evidence base is still negative regarding this point. One of assuring data about Facebook state, because two years back, I announced the results of New England paper about increased mortality. Chris trial, uh, increased mortality associated with Facebook state in comparison to aliburinol in gouty patients. But uh, there is a very nice August 2020 meta-analysis published in Mayo Clinic proceeding confirming no difference in mortality, uh, Fibuc state or albuterol. So we should do, we should deal, wa use what we are accustomed to use. And I think Dr. Tarek Tantawi is uh, joining this meeting and he can add uh, uh, one or two sentences in the issue of hyperuricemia. Dr. Tarek, please unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum, uh, okay. Many thanks, uh, Professor Robert for your uh, practical approach uh, about hypertension and CKD. All, uh, all are enjoyed and we hope uh, the best uh, situation in Peru. Uh, as regards the hyperuricemia and the progression for chronic kidney disease, actually we have a role for treatment with modification of doses of aliburinol in case of CKD, as you mentioned, and actually fibroxistat as a molecule, uh, as a lowering uh, uric acid level, uh, more uh, effective and more beneficial uh, all, uh, also, uh, when we mentioned about uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, the beneficial effect of uh, to lower uh, uric acid uh, to the patient. 
we cannot uh, we cannot allow the patient with a high level of uric acid uh, in, uh, in case of CKD. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Tare. But uh, one only one point I, I would like to add: if we have a patient with severe degree of CKD, stage five CKD, I think we should be cautious when we use fibroxate, and we should monitor symptomatology like myalgia, muscle ache, because there are some reports about myopathy in patients with stage five CKD. To the extent, I think, from the brochure, the industrial company, I think there is restriction to use the FIBOC state to very low level of GFR. Do you agree with this point, Professor Robert? I agree. So very carefully, uh, this issues. Yes. FIBOC state. Okay. Dr. Tar, the mic is to you again. So we can, we can conclude that we should be treating all of our patients with a low dose rebox, uh, fibroxistat rather than allopurinol, just to consolidate on this particular point because yeah. it's debatable. Every few years, you get publications saying you should treat, and then you get just like what Hussein uh, Shaisha just mentioned you shouldn't be treating. And uh, by the end of the day, uh, you are really mixed up whether you should follow this or that. I like to add my opinion, if I'm allowed to say so, to yours and to Tariq Tantawi. Yes, we should treat because patholog pathology, pathology is, is reality, is real life. Pathology did show that hyperuricemia is doing harm to the kidney. But as you are using small doses, I, I, I like this very much, and maybe every other day uh, it could be really helpful. So this is just to consolidate on this uh, particular point. I, I, I recall in one of your slides that you said something about uh, hypertension. Uh, hypertensive patients don't do not develop end-stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease. Am I right about this? Am I right about such slides or? And the first study and uh, which one goes, I didn't go study. Uh, there was many randomized control trials. Oh, they are all prospective studies. They are prospective. Retrospective. Retrospective. Retrospective, retrospective, retrospective yes. studies. So, uh, uh, I don't know, really, I don't know if, uh, if it's real, in real life, it's, uh, I think it's So again, another point to consolidate about yeah. uh, this particular statement that hypertension doesn't cause chronic kidney disease after all this research over the last four decades uh, yeah. at this particular point. What do you have to say? What do you have to say if you want to say a message to the participants and audience related to hypertension and chronic kidney disease? Is it is there is a strong the, the presentation uh, go far, treat well your patient with hypertension in CKD. CKD patient with hypertension, you have to we have to treat well, not only for uh, cardiovascular disease, but also for CKD, also for CKD. What I said my, in my in real life and my experience, 25 years experience in uh, CKD patients, uh, patients with controlled blood pressure are doing much better than patients with uncontrolled blood pressure. And the evolution exactly. is completely different. This, this but, is if you allow me, Professor Tar, uh, the yes. uh, one of interesting points from Professor Robert's presentation is uh, that we shouldn't say the patient has kidney disease, CKD, and is hypertension, it is hypertension CKD. We should challenge ourselves. We should treat hypertension, yes, but we should yes. challenge ourselves searching for etiology. Well, of course. Because, because there are many uh, physicians all over the world uh, are not convinced by hypertension as the cause of indecision kidney disease. And this same is what like, uh, diabetic nephropathy. Same yeah, yes. Nephropathy. So I, I like I like I like your conclusion for the first part of the presentation very much, and this is the this ensure 
in the, and in the concordance of Professor Adel Afifi, because Professor Adel Afifi is one of the very uh, important uh, figures in nephrology in Egypt. And he is the man who started the uh, surveillance and survey for the cause of industry since uh, many decades. So uh, he reconsidered uh, hypertension under certain criteria, like the case you presented. If the patient hypertension is preceding the onset of CKD by many years, no nephrotic range of protonuria or protonuria should be uh, either minimal or mild. And uh, hypertrophy of the heart is there. So this means it's hypertension that is the, may be the cause of uh, CKD. The surest sign, as Professor Robert mentioned, if we do biopsy. So I am no, I'm not going to do biopsy, but if there is any clue for systemic disease or specific mm -hmm. etiology, I shouldn't be reluctant for doing biopsy. The, I think this is one of the key messages of this presentation. Yes, there is a link between hypertension and CKD, but we shouldn't overdo. We should look at the patient every case and respect the data presented, searching for etiology if we have a clue. So uh, we all agree about this point, and it was clearly shown by Professor uh, Robert. Not all, not all hypertensive patients are going to develop the classic uh, nephro, uh, nephrosclerosis that has been described with hypertension. But still, we have to respect uh, being hypertensive and having a chronic kidney disease for an, another etiology, whatever, interstitial, uh, glomerular disease. The, the mere presence of hypertension associated with such a pathology is definitely going, going to lead uh, to progression. I'm not talking about those patients with nephrosclerosis. The ASK trial, if you recall, all of you has more or less looked into such patients. Those patients with real nephroangiosclerosis, uh, the black uh, or the African Americans who had nephroangiosclerosis definitely related to hypertension. They looked into this uh, particular point. Now, Prof you Professor Tare. Yeah. Uh, would you please allow me just to unmute Professor Riyad Saeed because he's, he raised his hands. Yes, uh, please, shoot. Professor Riyad. Riyad. مساء الخير. مساء الخير. شكرا شكرا روبير على المحاضرة القيمة. سعيد جدا انه شفناك وغلبنا ان شاء الله بخير. Two points really. You know, I'd like to start from the last point that Dr. Tariq and mentioned or Dr. Hussein. Now, the, when we see a young individual, let's say less than 30, about traditionally we used to see in the past that hypertension less than 40, usually we have to think about secondary hypertension. More than that, we have to think about primary hypertension as a cause. But really, most of the time, if you have some proteinuria, you have hematuria, you have something like that with hypertension, I'll be more aggressive doing kidney biopsy. As you illustrated in your slide, you have a good percentage of your patient, they have secondary glomerular, they have glomerular disease, staging from membranous, IgA, and others. We do see a good number of IgA patients who are presented with hypertension, with some element of impaired kidney function. So don't shy from having kidney biopsy. That's really my message first. Secondly, I'd like to say, uh, I don't know, I missed maybe obstructive sleep apnea. We have to consider that as a cause. Most of the time we see some of the resistant hypertension. Okay, and resistant hypertension usually, it's one of the good number of patients nowadays with obstructive sleep apnea. Finally, the dipping that you mentioned, debar and non debar that's quite important in order to adjust medication. Now, in fact, most of, at least in my practice, I advise my patient to take more of the drugs at night Okay, late dosages, not early in the morning except diuretics. But most of the regular medication, let's take it at night to in order this for the dipping and non debar part of the treatment should be really taken in consideration. These are the three comments that really I have. I don't Professor know Riyad, what's the comment. I yes. Professor Riyad, I like your comments. All the three comments are very valuable. Yeah. And I would like to stress on the third one. Chronotherapy is one of the very nice. Chronotherapy means, as mentioned by Professor Robert, 
is to consider giving some antihypertensive drugs during the night, during, uh, before yes. sleep. And ju uh, just one sentence from uh, one of the editorial comments about some of the studies of the nocturnal antihypertensive treatment. One, bills, one bill at night makes everything right. So uh, to consider giving the antihypertensive treatment during the night, I think it is of uh, priority because it uh, helps to reduce the problems of nocturnal hypertension or non dibbers uh, And this is associated with many cardiovascular comorbidities and mortality. Thank you very much, Professor Riyad, for your valuable comments. Thank uh, you, Riyad. Thank you, okay. Riyad. I agree with you. The last biopsy I did one month ago, so as a patient, uh, 55 years old is followed by a GP for hypertension. Uh, he came uh, to see me with a creatine 1.5. He was considered as essential hypertension. So I did a biopsy and found the IgA nephropathy. It's, uh, it's so simple. So history is, is important, but I'd like to ask you about this case. Yeah. Uh, was there proteinuria, significant proteinuria in the case or just hematuria? Uh, just a little hematuria and uh, 0 0.5 gram per 24 hours. Because, because in this case scenario, the treatment is treatment to blood pressure. This, this is what we have because as... Uh, so... Uh, he didn't have any macroscopic hematuria. He did not yes. any macroscopic hematuria. As okay, the age thank you. Uh, was good for IgA. Okay, Dr. Saeed Khamis raised his hand. Dr. Saeed. Thanks, Professor Hussain. Thanks, Professor Robert, for this elegant presentation. Just I have two, two, two questions regarding the uh, hypertension and the progression of CKD. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the fluctuation of PB, of blood pressure, I mean, uh, is more dangerous than the uh, resistant hypertension or the reverse uh, regarding the progression of CKD. Second question regarding the uh, paradoxical hypertension during dialysis. I know it is a challenging problem for all of us, but from your own experience, uh, what is the solution you found uh, to be the best management of this uh, challenging problem? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, for the first question, uh, uh, resistant hypertension is, I think, is more dangerous than fluctuation of blood pressure. And uh, we have to confirm this uh, by uh, a halter ABPM. ABPM, it's very important to do for the majority of the patient for me. But unfortunately, we cannot do it for every patient here in Iran. It's a little bit costly. Uh, so it's uh, important to, uh, to treat resistant hypertension. Uh, for the second uh, question, Second question about uh, hypertension in dialysis patient. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to control. When you have fluctuation of hypertension in uh, some dialysis patient, we have uh, over 100 patients. In my department, I have two patients, and it's really difficult to control. Uh, first, we have to look uh, to cardiac function, echocardio. We have to do echocardio, uh, dry weight. It's not easy to set dry weight. And uh, the most efficient uh, treatment is uh, ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, a high dose after the session. Just after the session, we gave them ravipril 10 milligram or uh, even uh, captopril if you, if you have captopril, it's efficient. During the session, uh, only patches of nitrodam, nitrodam we, can, we can use. It's not easy to control. I agree with you. But if the, the, regarding the first point, we don't like variability because variability is not physiological and be associated with many problems. So but, this is why... We have to confirm variability. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We have to because variability, variability is translated... Okay. Okay, the mic is to Professor Robert, yes. Thank you. Okay. Professor Faisal Shaheen. Yes, thank you Robert, for this excellent talk. And uh, I like the discussion very much, especially about hyperuricemia. If um, probably most of our the elderly people, the old nephrologists, uh, just a couple of years back, 
they came out uh, how to stop progression of renal disease. And it was mainly due to statin and allobrunal, or at that time, uh, or hyperlysemia. You have to deal with hyperlysemia and also statin. Nowadays, things are coming in a different way. Some studies, even randomized study, doesn't show that uh, exactly. But still, we have so many patients admitted to the hospital with hypertensive encolopathy, and at the same time, their creatinine is high. And when we treat them, the creatinine is coming down, and their GFR is, became better. So this means that there is a link, direct link, between hypertension and CKD. And that's why I think we have to treat the CKD patient, and probably the study would show the difference between uh, either you treat or not. I, I think I have doubt about it from my own uh, practice. The second point, probably you didn't mention about using of AC inhibitor and ARP and, and, and CKD patient and hyperkalemia, which is one of the important issue, which let us shift the ARP and AC inhibitor to some other drug. Uh, maybe I missed that point. I, maybe I, I, it was in your slide, but uh, I think also this is very important for our colleague. The third point about the biopsy. Uh, not every patient who had hypertension presented with mild CKD, I will go to take biopsy because if I have already some clue that this kidney had nephrosclerosis, there is no need to do biopsy. If I have shrunk kidney by ultrasound, even with proteinuria, which is mild proteinuria, I will not go to take biopsy because I am sure 100% that the result will come to be hypertensive nephrosclerosis. So probably if I have normal sized kidney with someone who is hypertensive with raised creatinine, proteinuria, I will go to do the biopsy. Otherwise, if it is shrunk kidney by ultrasound, non-invasive, and I can say no, it's not, it, most probably it will be hypertensive nephrosclerosis. Uh, this is my own opinion, thank you. I agree with you for, uh, first for kidney biopsies, I won't go for kidney biopsy if there is a small kidney, kidney on, on ultrasound or CKD kidney on ultrasound. I won't do it. I will do it uh, only if you have a normal size kidney and uh, some clues for uh, nephropathy. I agree completely with you. Uh, what about the potassium? About the potassium, I said many times that you have to follow uh, the potassium. I'm not afraid of potassium. I follow very close my patient uh, level of potassium to continue to use at maximum maximum time the ARBs and the ACE inhibitors. So uh, oh. I agree with you. I have to go uh, far with ARBs and ACE inhibitors and don't be afraid from hyperkalemia. Okay, if you allow me, Professor uh, Robert and Professor Tarek, because this is one of the important points that I would like to comment about. The, the uh, agents of antihypertensive. Yes, I agree 100% for the use of ACE inhibitor or ARBs if we are thinking of hypertensive CKD patients, especially in the presence of proteinuria, either ACE inhibitor or ARBs, and then we can add uh, diuretics or calcium shine blockers, and at the end of the day, if there is resistance, we can add uh, potassium sparing diuretics. This, these are the best agents in the presence of CKD. But in dialysis, let me argue uh, with Professor Robert about the choices of antihypertensive drugs in dialysis. I don't like to start with this inhibitor or ARPs in dialysis. I start, as you mentioned, by reviewing dry body weight and to take deep inspiration because uh, a still pre-dialysis blood pressure up to 170 is not harmful for, for the beginning, so we take time for adjusting dry body weight. And then the drug of choice for my mind and from the literature is beta blocker. Because dialysis is a state of sympathetic uh, overactivity and the beta blocker is uh, uh, selected according to the patient profile. If the patient has many episodes of intradialytic hypotension, then we use the drugs uh, uh, like metoprolol. But if the patient has interdialytic hypertension, we use carvedilol. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, this is the second drug is calcium shine blocker, and then followed lastly by 
as you mentioned, by minoxidil. And I think, uh, and the S inhibitor may be the third agent before minoxidil. S inhibitor or ARPS to the, uh, to, to the third category, not the first category. I would like to hear from you about this point because th this is not my opinion uh, from myself. It is from reading and from recommendation from uh, different literature. During the session, I agree with you, beta blockers, uh, CCBs is good. But in my experience, uh, when you still have high, very high blood pressure after the session, uh, nothing work uh, like ACE inhibitors, especially captopril, especially captopril after the session. And I start always by evaluating cardiac status by echocardiogram to the patient to, to see the indication for beta blockers like carvedilol or metoprolol. Uh, I, I agree with you. Okay. But, but I, don't, I, I don't mean uh, the, that we have uh, severe hypertension in the session and how to deal with this. I, I, I mean the presence of hypertension between the Alice session. The patient is hypertensive. Okay. Yes. This is a, a different issue to start with beta blocker followed by. I, I, uh, I yes. start beta blockers, I start with. Uh, okay. And the, at the end, I, I finish by, by ACE inhibitors. Okay. I agree with yes, you. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. And one point regarding the target in transplant patients yes, mm -hmm. after one month of transplantation, 130 over 80 is fine. Yeah. But in the uh, first uh, two weeks of transplantation, we, we even prefer the blood pressure to be even if uh, above 140 over 90, if it's 100, 150 over 100, we keep it to uh, keep the kidney perfusion. And uh, the, I like the, your figures of blood pressure because this year we have the Canadian 2020 hypertension guidelines and the international sort of hypertension guidelines and I like in the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines that they omitted 12080 as hypertension because the, there was a silly recommendation from the American style of recommendation since a couple of years that mm -hmm. 120 to 130 is uh, starting hypertension. Nowadays, it's 14090, as you mentioned. So they, in the 2020 International Society of Hypertension Guidelines, they go back to the briefest definitions of hypertension. I like this. And I think the most important the critical is how to measure blood pressure. Yep. Do you uh, like to comment on the measurement? Yes, please. It is another chapter. I didn't uh, yes. go to the chapter. Uh, yeah, it's very important to know, uh, to know how to measure hypertension, uh, ambulatory blood pressure at uh, ABPM first, uh, office uh, measurement and home measurement. Uh, I always tell my patient to take their blood pressure at home before coming to the office. It's very important to learn them how to take the blood pressure at home, how to rest uh, 15 minutes in the sofa or uh, in their chair, in their bed, whatever, and uh, rest and how to take the blood pressure. I take my time to explain to the patient how to take the, the blood. If the blood pressure is good at home, home measurement, I don't take care, I don't uh, take care of the office blood pressure because there is always a white coat hypertension at the office, even as a patient, as an old patient with many years with you. Uh, and when I can do an ABPM, I will go to ABPM. And what so, is the style uh, of measurement? To learn. Okay. Do you, do you prefer oscillometric method? Or you still uh, cystoscope or sculptatory? What, what is the no, method? No, automated or automated? Automated, automated. Okay. Automated always. Okay, we the mic is to Professor uh, Torre again, yes. Yes, uh, automated undoubtedly is the guideline now for oh. measuring. Oh. Uh, so this is uh, the reference. Uh, I believe that treating hypertension, maybe we agree, is more difficult than treating blood sugar. I have a glycated homoglobin that tells me what's the blood sugar like after a month, after two or three. But we don't have the same situation for blood pressure. You could be checking the patient's blood pressure or he can be checking his blood pressure himself to find it fine when after a couple of hours it shoots and he has no symptomatology. That's why this is a very serious disease. Really, it is very yeah. serious. And... Uh, all the complications happening mainly to the heart 
with the enlargement of the left ventricle under the effect of the blood pressure. So we don't have to take it lightly, especially that Hussein Shaisha showed us uh, a, a very interesting uh, slide at the beginning of the presentation, showing us that only a third of patients are really uh, controlled. Well, that's what this data he showed says. I believe even more, less than that. For doctors like us, if we are hypertensive, you just tell me, can you have a blood pressure recording that much during the day, just like ambulatory, to tell you that your blood pressure is really under control when you're stressed, when you're shouting, when you're uh, uh, doing exercise. So blood pressure is something not to be taken lightly. And we have to be really uh, very aggressive about treating blood pressure and not to be, uh, I mean, uh, inhibited from prescribing uh, extra dosage or a second or a third uh, line. I see a lot of, uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, not very good practice sometimes in dealing with hypertension. Do you agree about this being, being yourself uh, taking care so much about hypertension? Robert. I agree with you. Yeah, Dr. Robert, yes. Yeah. Uh, it depends. It depends uh, with which one is practicing. The GPs nowadays are very aware about controlling hypertension, especially in Lebanon. We did a lot of campaign to, uh, to the GPs, to the general medicine doctors, about controlling hypertension. Uh, myself, myself, I am very aware, and all nephrologists in Lebanon are aware about hypertension because we did a lot of conference on hypertension. We are very active with uh, pharma, uh, with small conference uh, across the country. And in our meeting, in, in uh, national meeting, as you know, we always focus on hypertension. We have uh, sessions about hypertension. Fantastic. I think the awareness is the, the, the first step toward the prevention of, mal of under and treatment. The of public health is very active with us. Yes. Awareness. They but have we have a question to you before uh, Professor Riyad again, uh, because he raised his hands. Uh, if this is one of the questions in the chat, uh, how to deal with erectile dysfunction, because treating hypertension may be associated with impotence. <laughs> uh, so this is a question to Professor Robert. <laughs> the balance between antihypertensive treatment and occurrence of symptoms and one of the compelling symptoms in men is impotence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, do you do you respect this issue or yeah, <laughs> what I, do you I do? I try always to not <laughs> prescribe beta blockers to men, so I try always, but sometimes we are obliged to to do so. Uh, uh, I don't uh, ask always the questions to the patient because, you know, uh, oriental uh, men, they, don't, they are shy, they don't uh, like to speak about this, uh, this issue. But I try always to ask them this question. If there is any problem, how to help, how to change treatment. So, uh, do, you have say, an experience, do you have an experience with Nibivolol, which is a type of beta blocker, uh, and the, the, the uh, some... Yes, beta blocker with, yeah, use, with fast dilatation use, and with uh, less erectile dysfunction. Do you have any experience? With, do you yeah? Do you have any experience with this? Yeah. I use for the majority of our patients. Nibivolol. Yeah, yes, for, from many years, from ten years, I am using Nibivolol. We have it here in it's Lebanon since many years. I don't so, use the parole for men. So, or so th this means that you respect the erectile dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. Because, because nibivolol is associated with the vasodilatation, I think it is the least anti glucose. Yes, Professor Riyad. Well, I'd like really, you know, to mention combination therapy. You know, I do not know whether someone really mentioned that. Compliance really is the most important thing. One of the issues that just really has been alluded to the erectile dysfunction, but. We can really overcome a lot of complications by just compliance of the patient. Don't forget that he's taking so many, it's pharmacopoeia, taking 10 tablets, 15 tablets a day, calcium, uh, vitamins, and all these things, and they add around four or five tablets of medication. So combination therapy is really currently, it's a fixed combination. 
I'll say fixed combination, it will work really beautiful for compliance of our patient. So that's number one. Secondly, by all means, we have to control blood pressure to slow the progression of renal disease. And there is a nice article by Dr. Baker from Chicago. You know, it has been estimated if your mean arterial pressure around 130, you're going to lose GFR at a rate of 12 ml per minute per year. If you drop that mean down to 90, you know, just 110, your drop of GFR is going to be around 6 ml per minute per year. If you drop it systolic, diastolic, 120, 130 to 80, which is, that's the standard and the accepted recommendation now, you're going to drop your GFR by 2.5 ml per minute. So it's really drastic improvement if you control your blood pressure to target. But again, awareness, most of the patients, they are not aware of their hypertension. If they are aware of the hypertension, they are not really well controlled because they are not taking medication. Again, the cost of medication. That's really we have to tackle in this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Riyad. If you allow me just a few points. In the, the European Society guidelines for hypertension two years back, recommending from the start combination. And the combination either uh, respect the patient characteristics, uh, either using ACE inhibitor plus diuretic if the patient is edematous, or ACE inhibitor or ARBs uh, with calcium shine blocker if the patient is not edematous, and then adding a third and the fourth line after that. So combination from the European style is the recommended strategy. Regarding the intensive blood pressure control, as you mentioned in your second comment, I, I think this is con concordant with the Canadian guidelines this year, is to do intensive blood pressure control for patients with CKD with a symmetry of R between 20 to 60, so to, to accept one systolic less than 120 for those who are not diabetic and symmetry of R between 20 to 60. For this category of patient, they got the benefit uh, from intense blood pressure control. I agree with all what you mentioned. I think uh, awareness plus lifestyle modification, special assault restrictions are of paramount importance. Professor Tari Elbaz, the mic is to you again. Yes, combination therapy, this is just a point that the Professor Riyad was talking about, it's something very important. We shouldn't be reluctant about adding a second line or third line, just as I mentioned. We should be very serious about treating blood pressure and not just <clears throat> consider that the patient uh, uh, is taking his medication, this is not enough because compliance, we are all practicing uh, uh, medicine and we know that compliance sometimes is really a problem. There are a lot of factors behind uh, the compliance, uh, whether uh, psychological or economical. This is an important fact. Mind you, a lot of the antihypertensive medications on, on, on the market, at least in our country here in Egypt, they are not all alike. And I cannot call that these medications are real uh, generics. They are not generics. They are just copies. And these copies, you don't know where this raw material is coming from and how uh, efficient it is. Uh, and, and this adds to the problem. Uh, the patient is really taking his medication, Professor Riyad, and, but he's still not, not, not controlled. And when he shifts to uh, uh, another drug or maybe... Uh, the original uh, brand of a certain drug, he starts to get control. So we have uh, a, an extra burden on our hands. And uh, what, what can we do? It's always cost that limits us from uh, doing uh, our prescriptions. Uh, uh, a point here in the chat, Dr. Tar and Baz and Dr. Robert, uh, nephrectomy for treating resistant hypertension. Do you have any experience? Do you recommend? No one. <clears throat> no one is doing this anymore, oh. and uh, uh, no one is really doing it. Very, 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 very. And this is my point too. So I, I don't like yes. because yes. I, 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 I was confronted by a, a rushing a pediatrician who even doing nephrectomy for nephrotic syndrome, and I don't like this this strategy because. How to, how to do an for a child 
with relatively normal serum creatinine because of refractory proteinuria. So I, I, I don't like the style of nephrectomy, even for it's this. It's not a style, this is a very outdated uh, yes, uh, yes. therapies. No mm -hmm. more, no more. Just uh, you, you, you can't do, uh, you can't treat people. And it is, it is a, I think it's the last resort in end stage on dialysis or before transplantation for severely hypertensive patients. And this is what we do. If the patient is on dialysis and it treated well with dry body weight and anti-hypertensive medication, is still hypertensive out of control, then we do staging nephrectomy, one uh, before transplantation and the other with uh, the uh, surgery of transplantation. And by the time the patient again becomes hypertensive, but it reduces the burden of hypertension to uh, uh, some uh, point. Dr. Yad? I have a question to all of you. Uh, yes. If you like to discuss related to the ablation therapy. Yes. Uh, there's been a lot <laughs> of complications. Dr. Yad? That's exactly, I'm glad Dr. Tarek mentioned this. That's exactly my question. What about ablation, <laughs> sympathectomy, and cautery? That's exactly the question Instead of I was the posing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, Tarek. It's mine, you know, just. Okay, that's Professor, my question. Professor Robert? I didn't look after this issue. Really, to, to, oh, yeah. to give you a response, I didn't look after this issue. You, you know, my recollection, about, uh, my recollection about this simplicity, one, two, three, really doesn't work. I think there's something that will cause a lot of complication and it's not really beneficial. I don't know about Dr. Tarek, you mean, what do you think uh, about this? Renal denervation, do you yeah. mean, Dr. Yad? Yes, yeah, renal yeah. denervation. Yes, yeah, exactly. Stop to do it in France, I think. Mm. Uh, mm. Say, stop to do it. It's really something should be yeah. simplicity three. Really, just I mean, there is no benefit from this. That's my recollection. Okay, the, that, the, uh, I think uh, there are uh, more recent studies in the Lancet uh, showing that some techniques may help, and they described some new techniques for, for renal denervation. But I am from the school that, uh, that uh, Professor Ed believed in that renal denervation may be just translation of non-compliance. And if the patient is, uh, uh, if, if we treat the patient in a randomized fashion and they take care of the patient, then the treatment will be improved. And I think this is a bias in the evaluation of denervation. So I don't, I don't trust uh, very much in denervation, but I think it is one of the strategies that be, uh, may be done in some patients, especially in a center which is expert in, in, in dealing with this. Otherwise, it become industrial and money for some, and I think it is uh, maybe of no value. Last presentation uh, I saw, I assist in France, uh, they, have, they had very bad results about the innovation. Some, okay. some place in Paris, so they have uh, very bad results, so they stopped to do it. I believe it's related to the experience, and it reminds me many years ago when the Japanese were a, a particular center were real experts in uh, ablation of the parathyroid gland using uh, alcohol injection, if you, if you remember. Uh, nobody was that good to get uh, as, as good results as these people who were really uh, publishing very good results because they just knew how to do it. It doesn't mean that it was, it's, it's bad or it doesn't work, but they knew how to do it. Well, elsewhere, Anybody tried to inject alcohol, <laughs> he was making a lot of problem, and then the results were always negative. I don't know. We can... If you allow, yes. If you allow me, just in extension of the intervention uh, treatment of, for hypertension, the issue of revascularization of renal artery stenosis, it shouldn't be routine, and it should be restricted to certain categories of patients. Patients with renal vascular hypertension. If the patient is resistant, if the patient presents with acute heart failure, acute renal failure, or after giving antihypertensive treatment, the patient uh, develops acute renal failure. These are the critical indication. Or if the, if the blood pressure is out of control, uh, despite the use of maximal antihypertensive treatment. But rushing in doing, even uh, dilatation for renal artery stenosis is not beneficial. And uh, there is a very nice just one simple sentence, revas revascularization is not the solution. 
for renovosal hypertension, except in certain category of patients that I just mentioned. I'm glad you, you, you raised this point. I believe that nephrologists understand so well, and they are the least people who are looking for renovascular hypertension and angiographies to prove this, prove the presence of uh, uh, renal artery stenosis. And you underlined another point, even if you are going to dilate the stenotic uh, uh, part, who says that this is going to be a treatment for hypertension? Thank you very much for raising this point, uh, Professor Hassin. Thank you. If you allow me, I would like to hear from Dr. Yasser Mullah from Edinburgh Hospital. Dr. Yasser. Unmute yourself, and uh, I would like to hear from you. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Hussain. Excellent talk, excellent presentation. I fully agree with all the comments and all the discussion. Uh, we did try renal denervation at Sultan Kabush University Hospital in Muscat, and that was before I left in about 2011 to 2012. And we had about 50 patients at that time because there was a group of Omani doctors who just came back from Canada. But I don't think that the result was encouraging at all. When I joined Hammersmith in 2013, 2014, they used to do it, but it's abandoned now. And in the last five years, they don't do renal denervation anymore in the last five years. And again, the outcome of that wasn't encouraging at all. And I fully agree that nephrectomy for resistant hypertension is outdated. I just have one question, probably not directly related to the talk or part related. Sometimes we have a patient who comes in as a crash lander with an AKI and a very high blood pressure, like possibly at the time of presentation is about 200 over 100. And they got an evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG. Those patients are not known to be hypertensive at all. And this was discovered at the time of presentation to the hospital. My only question is, and, and when you do the ultrasound, they got normal sized kidneys, the AKI partly improves or like, you know, doesn't go back to normal at all, significant proteinuria, and we think that biopsy is indicated. My only question is about the timing of the biopsy, because we have two schools in the UK, at least in the hospitals where I did work. Some of them will say, once the blood pressure is controlled, fire, do the biopsy. And some would say, no, the risk of bleeding is very high, because there was very uncontrolled hypertension for a while, patients not on any agents, get the blood pressure well controlled for at least four to six weeks, then do the biopsy. And the concern is about onioning of the vessel and the high risk of the bleed. So I just want to know, in different parts of the world, when you get a patient not known to be hypertensive, crush lander, AKI, or possibly, who knows, maybe CKD, normal sized kidneys, significant proteinuria, once you get the blood pressure controlled, when do you do the biopsy? Do you do it immediately during that admission? Or do you agree that we need to wait for about four to six weeks? Excellent talk, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasser Mullah. And I think the mic is to Professor Robert and then Professor Ta El Baz uh, to hear that the best timing for doing a biopsy for patient presents with severe hypertension and acute kidney injury. Professor uh, Robert. Thank you for the question. Uh, personally, I won't go for any kidney biopsy with uncontrolled hypertension. It's uh, very hard to, to see a kidney, a kidney bleeding and you are losing your kidney. Uh, especially if you have acute kidney injury, you will lose uh, the half of uh, your kidney, 50% of your renal function. So I will wait. I don't know how much I will wait. For how long, for how long do you wait, so, Dr. Robert? I will wait till the blood pressure is controlled. One, two, so, three days, one week, two weeks, three okay. weeks, but uh, I'm obliged to, to wait. I will try my best to, low, uh, to lower the blood pressure. I will go for the biopsy, maybe in two days, okay. one week. But I don't okay. think six months is too much. It's too, too late for okay. six months to do a kidney biopsy. If you have an acute kidney. Professor Elbaz? Professor Elbaz, yes. Regarding, regarding the, the biopsy issue, the timing of biopsy, yes. Yes, severe hypertension and, 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 the, and the AKI. I don't think that hypertension particularly is, is, is any kind of indication for uh, the biopsy, but you would rather be biopsying a patient with AKI uh, for, for, for trying to find why he has AKI. If it's, if it's not obvious due to an... Uh, obvious cause, if I'm right in, in how I'm approaching the patient, not for the blood pressure at all, because I expect that an AKI patient very much could be hypertensive. 
Okay, I thank you very much, Professor Tari. My point or my opinion, if the patient presents with hypertension and I decided to do biopsy because acute kidney injury may be crescent glomerulonephritis. So if the patient is proteinuric, hematuric, and there is severe hypertension, I, I should control blood pressure because doing a biopsy, while I have 200 over 100, the patient may bleed and this will be of medical, medical legal problem. So I yes. should control blood pressure and immediately without delay doing a biopsy if the blood pressure allows. So decreasing blood pressure to safe land and then go fast for biopsy so long as the biopsy indication and the kidney size allowing me for doing biopsy. Dr. Yasser Mullah, are you satisfied by this answer or not? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I fully agree with you, but, but the point that I was trying to sell, as I said, someone young coming in, in the A&E, the blood pressure is 200 over 120. He got evidence of papilledema, he got evidence of LV edge on the ECG or on the echo. Definitely, we do treat with medication, but let's say in two, three days' time, the blood pressure is 140, 150 over 80. Which is a safe, which is a safe target yes. for blood pressure. Yes, got normal sized kidneys, very proteinuric. So the question here, as I said, we got two schools. Some will say, oh no, let's do the biopsy now. The blood pressure at the moment is safe, but some will say, no, he came in with a 200 plus over 100 plus. There might be onioning of the vessels in the kidney. And if we do the biopsy now, despite that the blood pressure, let's say is 130 over 80, the risk of bleeding is very high. So they prefer to wait for four to six weeks, which I think is a bit too long because I agree with Prof. Shaisha, that you know, we might be missing something here, like a crescentic GN or something else, or an active and IgA nephropathy. So, you think that it's mainly the blood pressure at the moment of doing the biopsy rather than what was the blood pressure two, three days ago? So, what I, what I recommend is doing biopsy without delay yep. and discussing with the interventionist who will do the biopsy because in our center, intervention radiologist performs the biopsy. So, I should discuss with him to be gentle to take all the precautions, everything should be the follow. Uh, the patient is admitted for a day and if the patient has acute kidney injury, I shouldn't uh, make discharge except after clearance of diagnosis and doing treatment because sometimes the, uh, we, we were confronted by a case or some cases, uh, cryogolinemia and the cryogolinemia was a systemic disease and the main salient presentation in one of the cases was severe hypertension. So uh, yes, treating hypertension and going uh, immediately for uh, uh, biopsy without, uh, without marked redundancy or delay. Professor Riyad also wanted to add something here. Dr. Riyad. Unmute yourself, Dr. Riyad. I think the sooner you do the biopsy, the better. There is no yes. need for delay. Once your blood pressure is controlled, there is no need to send him home and come back. Okay, you'll do it when the blood pressure is under control. Under control means not really 200 over 110, you know, it's like a decent blood pressure, 170, 160 over 90, 95. I think you can do it safely. And by the way, I don't know, we are doing the kidney biopsy by ourselves. We don't allow the invasive radiologists to do it. It's still the procedure of nephrologists in our practice. I don't know in, yes. in, Lebanon, in Lebanon how it's being done. done. Uh, we do, we do the biopsy. Yeah, we I do the kidney do biopsy yeah. ourselves. I used to do it since 25 years, and nowadays they stop me because there is a new interventional radiology. So, <laughs> yeah, it's the same. They want the bust. My have, seniors. We have my seniors in nephrology. You know, we have fellows. We have to train them. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. My seniors so in nephrology. Yes. My seniors in nephrology. Uh, accustomed to you do, do the biopsy. And when I was a resident in early, in 93, 94, I do my, myself the biopsy, but under the umbrella of radiologists. And by the time the, the nephrologists are busy and, and they are busy with just recording the file. And I think I agree with Professor Ed Saeed. We should take this uh, strategy from any interventionist because this is one of the aim of intervention nephrology. I think we should do it by ourselves. You know, we have trainees, we have fellows. If you don't yes. really train them how to do it, they are, you know, going to lose any fact. You know, there are nothing left really for them. That's still, I think, the biopsy is the domain of nephrologists. Uh, uh, and I still do it myself. I still do it myself. We have here in this Zoom meeting, we have... Uh, excuse me. Uh, 
Uh, so, yes. Uh, Professor Riyad, uh, uh, are you recommending the biopsy uh, blind or? Uh, no, 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 no. Ultrasound or CT life. guided. Either no, no, sound. No. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, no. Okay. It's not a okay. blind, blind biopsy. I'll tell you, I did the blind biopsy, uh, I think, in 1980, eight, you know, 75, when I used to be a fellow. Uh, yes. After that, really, we didn't do it. Uh, it's only guided ultrasound guide or in our place I do it CT guided kidney biopsy. We have great results. Good, yes. So uh, uh, yes, we do it by ultrasound guided life technique and I don't like CT guided biopsy because it, it is semi blinded. Uh, ultrasound, by ultrasound I can see the needle but by CT it is not seen by uh, life. So CT guided biopsy is restricted to very obese persons for whom I cannot localize the kidney well by ultrasound. This is the, the, our school. And we have in this Zoom some colleagues from Mansoura University Hospital because they are growing and they, uh, they do this biopsy by themselves. They are uh, assistant lecturers and uh, so four years after uh, the starting their career in nephrology, they do biopsy efficiently. We have Mohammed Mamdouh with us and others, they did the biopsy by themselves. So it is according to the policy, as Professor Robert mentioned, it, if the hierarchy of the policy is dominating, then we will be driven either to one direction or the other. But I recommend, and I prefer the statement to Professor Riyad, and biopsy should be within the domain of nephrologists. Yep. Nephrologists should be trained on doing ultrasound for the kidney, doing the biopsy and doing all interventions that may help the patients. I like the Indian style or some, uh, in some areas, they even do fistula, distal fistula. The nephrologists do fistula by themselves. So this is, uh, I, I think we should do something to have all these interventions again in our uh, specialty. And I think uh, um, uh, Professor Tar El Baz, do you like to close the session because uh, uh, we are approaching two hours, or uh, do you have any comments? I really, you? I really enjoyed this meeting. I seeing, I love seeing Robert, my great friend, وأطمن عليه وأطمن على أهله وأطمن على حبيب يا رب يا رب ترجع كل حاجة أحسن. بذاركم. Thank you so much for this very very interesting uh, uh, discussion and the great talk. Justin. Uh, please, Dr. Tar, give me just one minute and, and uh, continue yes. your clo closer, closure. Uh, as I accustomed to do, I should announce that there is, there is no industrial, no industrial affairs for the ACNT CME activity. It is, uh, it is uh, all the time uh, uh, without any industrial sponsoring and without promotion. And today, it was very nice night. I like the style of Professor Robert in presenting in a quiet manner one of the critical issues. Hypertension needs not two hours, it needs 20 hours, and we cannot, we cannot finish because there are special mm -hmm. situations even in the nephrology domain. And I think uh, we will continue this month because we have Professor Bassam Saeed who will give a talk about update in the hypertension guidelines in pediatric age. So it seems that we will, uh, still we are waiting further details in hypertension management. I like this uh, night. I like the contribution of all professors and the colleagues in the chat. A special thanks and appreciation to Professor Riyad Saeed, Professor uh, Faisal Shaheen, Dr. Sa Professor Saeed Khamis, Dr. Tarat Antawi for their valuable comments added to this session. Uh, there is, uh, I cannot express my gratitude and appreciation to Professor Robert Neg, you are the Neg star. <laughs> and uh, the Professor Tai El Baz, all, uh, also, I love him and I love uh, the collaboration with him because he is always the man who left an impression. Because all the people will forget everything except the impression you left. If you allow me, Professor Tai El Baz, it is uh, just a symbol to Professor Robert Neg, a, a symbol of appreciation from Thank Egyptian Institute of Nephrology and Transplantation Continuous Medical Education for delivering this exciting presentation and for the discussion of management of hypertension in CKD. Also, it is a small appreciation to Professor Ta just a documentation and a symbol of love 
thank you very much and thank you all for your attendance and inshallah tomorrow morning the video will be uploaded to you and the last two statements one for professor tari albad and the last for Robert, professor robert Ney. dr tari professor tari albad last points last points is it was a great discussion i enjoyed it and looking forward to more and more inshallah inshallah professor robert Okay, shukran, we hope we hope for you the best and for Thank Lebanon you. the best uh, Lebanon and Beirut in the heart and it, as I mentioned it's the beauty beauty of the beauty yeah. so yeah. Um, thank you very much thank you very much full thank of you. appreciation thank you and goodbye thank you bye bye goodbye bye